just give another couple of minutes. All right. So welcome everyone uh, for the session. Uh, today's session is special. We are going to uh, talk to Priya. Uh, I will let Priya introduce her uh, herself in a minute, but uh, let me just give you an idea about what exactly the session is all about. Uh, so we are going to have a session where we are going to discuss with uh, Priya on her journey to uh, Judge Business School. Uh, it has been long, it has been tough, uh, it has been challenging, uh, like most of us, uh, and I would like to hear her story and uh, we will go through, uh, you know, it will be more like a conversation where we go through the whole process and we'll try to understand uh, how her journey has been to Cambridge. All right. So uh, welcome Priya uh, to the session. Thank you, Srikala. All right. So before we get started, customary, if all of us, uh, any, uh, whoever is joining this session, if you could just type in where you're joining from. Uh, just on the chat window, it'll help us understand where all and who all have reached out to us uh, through all different modes. So it'll be great if you could just put down on the chat window. So, okay, there's someone from An Anil from Bangalore. Uh, welcome, Anil. Just type on the chat window. Okay, there's someone from Hyderabad. Hi, Bhuvan. Wow, Ghana, Kolkata, Dubai. Maurya, Hyderabad. Interesting. Okay, there's someone from Kal Kolkata again. Indore, Bangalore. Great. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us on a nice uh, Saturday evening. Um, so all right. So before we get started, let me just quickly introduce myself. Hi, I'm Srikala. I'm one of the co-founders of Crack Verbal. Uh, I spent my uh, first half of my career working for HP. Uh, in the engineering team, and um, my, which is the second phase of my life is where uh, I have uh, managed the crackable business uh, literally from scratch and, uh, you know, focused on growing this to what we are today. Uh, I'm also part of the Cherry Blair Foundation where I help women entrepreneurs and I've also been ISB Goldman Sachs, uh, one of the women um, entrepreneurs, right? So I'm a fellow of that program too. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Priya. Hi Priya, if you could just quickly give us a short introduction before I ask you more uh, in depth. Uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself too. I think everyone here can already read what's on the slide. Um, what I can tell you about myself is I've had a very long journey um, starting from Bangalore. I've seen some people here are from Bangalore. So hello to my hometown. And um, I came from Bangalore to Germany. And uh, one of the maybe most tedious parts of my rather long journey has been the entire MBA admission process. So I'm here to talk to you about that and maybe help you navigate your own thoughts and your own um, your own. Uh, questions about it. Um, other than that, I, I work as, um, as an agile, uh, as, a, as an agile coach and a portfolio manager, and um, spent about 10 years um, helping large programs, large transformation programs, uh, mostly in Europe, um, a kind of navigate through their process of transformation and supporting everything that needs to be done in the human side of business to deal with transformation. So that's sort of my specialization. Interesting, interesting. So yeah, waiting to hear more from you, Priya. So before we get started, I will just give you a quick introduction about uh, Crack Verbal and what we do. Uh, so we basically help students with uh, GMAT preparation as well as the entire admissions process. Um, a couple of people who have we been, so we've been lucky to have uh, people like Priya, profiles like Priya to work with because it just, uh, you know, it, the whole process is so interesting for us uh, when we work with such profiles. So we have people from the finance background, we have people from technology background, people from, you know, people who are working with me TIO or in a completely social entrepreneurship kind of a background. So it's always very interesting. Some, uh, some of the students who've uh, cracked their GMAT as well as got into top schools. Um, we have a complete application process where we go through uh, from scratch, from understanding uh, what it takes to get into an MBA, to helping you select the schools, uh, to helping you with your essays, 
and what, what you know going through the entire process of everything that is important as part of the application so uh, we have a separate team that works with that we work with mentors who are from top schools uh, who have been there done that who understand what it takes to get into a top school too right so um, that's how uh, uh, intro intro to few of our mentors um, who are part of this so we have mentors from all top schools uh, from India, from US, from UK, from Canada, from Australia, from you know Asian schools too, and UK schools too. So um, apart from that, here is a quick uh, overview of what all we help with, specifically GMAT and admissions. So if you're looking at any help with respect to GMAT or admissions, please reach out to us. All right, all right. So um, let me get back to what we actually wanted to focus on today. Uh, which is what exactly takes what what it takes to get into one of the top schools in the world, right? So I will just shut my uh, share now. I don't need that anymore. So before we get started, thank you so much, Priya. Um, uh, just tell us a little bit about more about your career. So uh, I I remember talking to you and you mentioned you've done your masters. Uh, in Germany and that's where your uh, you know before your bachelor's did you after your bachelor's did you work in India or did you directly go for your master's maybe we can pick from there um, so I um, I come from a family that has a family business so after my bachelor's I did work with my father um, in our family business for a year uh, which gave me enough time to um, identify where I wanted to do my master's, what I wanted to do for my master's. So I spent about a year working in um, in India. And since it was a family business, it was already a lot of decision planning uh, work. It wasn't very operative, um, to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, after which I, um, yeah, it took me about a year and then I moved to Germany. All right. All right. So you moved to Germany for your master's, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. The plan was to do my master's and come back and take over the family business. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> but then instead you pursued your career in Germany for almost eight years. Six. I did 10, 10 years, 10 years, um, because I started working uh, pretty much as soon as I got here. Uh, mm -hmm. I think my first semester I did, uh, I did focus on getting used to European winters, which means four hours of sunlight. Um, after which, once I had a rhythm of what life in Europe would be like, I already started working after my first semester. So it was a good 10 years of working in Germany. Right, right. So, um, you know, when you're already going through this entire process, your career also has a good career progression. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you're doing what you like, you're seeing the results. Um, uh, you know, even in terms of your career progression, it has been uh, quite interesting, especially in Germany. So maybe if you could, you know, throw some light on that aspect of your profile. Um, so I think um, the realization started when I decided while I was in Germany that I wouldn't go back. Mm -hmm. um, the realization that I shouldn't make a plan uh, because everything just changes so fast. Uh, I changed so fast. Uh, I grew up in a different environment. I grew up with a different set of values. Um, and uh, I moved somewhere else where things were changing much faster. Uh, I liked it a lot more than I had assumed I would. Mm -hmm. um, and I also figured for the sort of person I was um, that the way things were done in Germany just fit me better. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did also uh, spend a good amount of time in London uh, where I did see that between the choice to stay back in London and come back to Hamburg in Germany, I decided to come back to Germany because I just fit better in the culture. So uh, keeping that in mind, I also decided that having a background in mechanical engineering and a master's in production management, I needed to stay very, very flexible and agile because this was before the time when digital transformation was a thing. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't want to go into pure management and strategy consulting because I truly enjoy industries. I, I enjoy machines and industries. So I had to find a niche and uh, I went from one client to another um, collected my experience and then decided to be an organization coach because um, I think the skill that I developed over the 10 years was to say there is no one size fits all there is no expertise um, the only skill I have is to go in to understand what needs to be done you know and give them a solution that's best suited for them and uh, 
I think I just moved from one industry to another. Uh, over the 10 years I worked uh, in the nonprofit sector. I worked uh, for the aerospace and defense sector. I worked for the semiconductor in industry. And right now I'm, I work for an industrial, industrial company that uh, produces logistics um, machinery as well as logistics software solutions. So I've moved into logistics now, um, but at the end of the day, I do the same thing. I coach the organizations to deal with transformation. All right. So when you say coach the organization to deal with transformation, which is across industries, uh, what is is there a particular uh, kind of problem like how you have in consulting, right? Is it like an operational problem that you're solving or uh, is it a program uh, that you help them take through or what exactly is, uh, is what you mean by, um, uh, you know, as an organization coach? Um, I think my role would be a mix of both uh, portfolio management. So um, what do you want to do? Um, where do you want to spend your money on? Hmm. And that's an easy, easy decision to do top down and say, I'm going to do five big projects and I'm going to buy all these new tools and technologies and I'm going to make my people use these tools and technologies and I'm going to achieve my strategy. But it doesn't always work like that because um, at the end of the day, people make the organization. So what I do is uh, try um, in most of my projects, it depends on where I go in at the project. So in a few of my projects, it's been about helping them define what needs to be done to achieve their strategy. And every client has a different strategy. Some of them have an, a business continuity strategy, an operational uh, issue, mm -hmm. uh, or at least they want to have better operational performance. Uh, some of them have a market strategy and a few of them have a sustainability strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And they're all different strategies. So depending on where I go in to support them, I either help them understand how to spend their money to achieve the strategy, or in a lot of places, there are already large programs being done to achieve the strategy that has this domino effect cascading down into the organizations. So I work on creating enablement structures so people really understand that this transformation is useful to them, mm. that it's useful to them. So it goes bringing the top down and the bottom up approaches together. So um, I've done both and I've also done end to end on one of my clients. Um, changing the strategy and building up the organization to meet the new strategy. It really depends on where you go in as, as a coach or a portfolio manager. Right. Interesting. So uh, 10 years of experience, um, you know, already doing uh, things which focus on strategy, which is typically, you know, uh, like a post MBA kind of roles that you get into. Right. So why was the need of looking at doing an MBA and uh, when you were actually thinking about it, especially with so much of work experience, what was going on in your mind that why did you want to shake things up and, uh, you know, suddenly, uh, you know, start studying for your GMAT and, you know, look at spending one year, uh, you know, uh, doing an MBA program. Why was that thought and why did that come to your mind? That's a great question. And I've gotten very good at answering that question, I must say. <laughs> I'm sure. uh, because uh, I think um, both my employers have asked me this question. And uh, uh, a lot of people that I spoke to, in fact, both the interviewers I spoke to at both the schools I had applied to told me, there is no way you will graduate from an MBA and get the salary you get at the moment. Why do you want to do an MBA? And uh, I think the way I approached taking a year off was very different. And um, I don't know, maybe of the 15 participants here with us today, someone would relate to this. Um, there is a concept of a sabbatical. You, know, you spend time investing on your life and, um, and then you take a break to reassess the decisions you have made. Now, I could have taken the sabbatical and spent the exact same money um, and seen the insides of 17 different airports and scraped through what Instagram tells me all these countries should be visited for. <laughs> or I could take this year off and go to a very dreamy place. I have uh, I have seen both Oxford and Cambridge when I was at London and they're beautiful. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I really enjoy living in old cities. Um, and instead of going to all these places, just spend a year um, absorbing and, you know, um, growing myself with people from all these different places, because places are great. Tourism is great. Being a tourist, being a traveler, that's great. But what really makes a place special are the people. If the best minds from all these countries are going to go into one place, it's like 
a one year long conference for me where I can learn from people. And I have gotten very, very good at understanding context and providing solutions. But what I don't know is how would someone else solve the same problem? So for me, the MBA, as much as the MBA is about, you know, getting getting to hear some of the wisest people talk and be my professors. I think for me, it's about getting to mingle with my cohort, who are some of the wisest people who possibly are there and adding an extra dimension to my perspective. So I think that's why I decided to take this year off. It's an investment I'm making on myself. Right, right. That's, that's, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, more from a perspective of, uh, you know, the real insight being why you would really want to do an MBA. Uh, yeah. uh, if you had to, you know, the same thing when we actually translate on the essays, right, we have to talk about more from a professional perspective also that what are the roles, uh, what are the roles that you're looking at doing, which will help you do whatever you want to do in that one year or uh, enable you to do uh, whatever you want to do after that one year. So what was what was your story behind saying that this is what I feel I don't have right now and because of which I really want to do an MBA? What was your pitch uh, more from that perspective? I mean, I think it was a two-step decision process. So the first step was to say, I need to take a year off, take a break, because I have been working very hard the past 10 years and do something worthwhile that will help me enhance myself. So I made that decision based on the fact that, hey, this would be an excellent learning experience. But I think I also need to get something concrete out of this journey, right? It shouldn't just be, I went there and I did this. I need to say, hey, along with this excellent, rather abstract learning journey, I want to focus on one thing. And I think where I have struggled in the past, where I've had, I've personally been very interested in, but I've also struggled in, say, quantifying in organizational decisions and portfolios is the entire aspect of putting in sustainability. Because when you come from building strategy, which is usually market growth, it's usually R&D, it's design, it's business continuity, you can translate every decision you make into a dollar value. And then you compare which one takes the least dollars and gives the most dollars. But sustainability over there, ends up having a very, um, it can't be quantified until it goes wrong. So you need to talk about if I don't do this, this is what it would cost me other than things that are clearly put in compliances and rules. And both the universities that I end up, so this is the choosing of which university I wanted to go. I wanted to go to two universities that were working very close, closely with the EU and that really look into sustainability, not just from a social innovation people perspective, but also from design circularity and other science, uh, scientific and um, science-based targets for sustainability. That's where I was lacking as a portfolio manager and I was completely dependent on people who could do it. And mm -hmm. I figured after I decided to take my sabbatical, my selection of the two universities depended on what can I, what is missing or what's my least, um, let's say least um, strong, um, skill set at the moment, what can I get more out of? And I think that's how I decided on the two schools and um, where I could possibly pivot after my MBA. Right, right. Very interesting, you know, you said that, Priya, because uh, when, you know, most of, uh, you know, who are applying this year and the process that they're going through right now is always this confusion that, uh, you know, what is it that I should say which would be something that is accepted or looks impressive to the admission committee, right? And that is typically the approach most people look at and think that that is the approach they should be focusing on. Rather, uh, you know, it has to be because there is so much competition, I think, number one. Number two, uh, because there are so many opportunities available more in each kind of work that you're looking at, right? Because if you're just looking at technology, there is a plethora of opportunities only in technology itself. So there are so many new things coming up. I think what we should focus on and something very interesting that Priya said is about focusing on that one skill set or the couple of skill sets that you have. Look at what you need to go to the next level with that particular skill set that you're focusing on. That was brilliant, uh, you know, Priya. I think this is something that is what we need to introspect during this entire process of when we are looking at uh, applying to your school and convincing ourselves 
uh, you know, more than convincing the admission committee that why MBA is so important, uh, you know, at this point in your life. That's amazing, yeah. Exactly. I think it's a fun fact because um, a good friend of mine started applying for the MBA with me. Uh, so we know each other from high school in India. We went to the same KV in India and she's um, she's here in Germany now. And um, she, we found each other in one of these Porter Foundation calls mm -hmm. and we had a chat. And at, I think at one point she realized that she will always be in an expert path and taking a break to do an MBA was not the right decision for her. Uh, she said, I'd much rather work for two more years and do a PhD after, right? Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what do you want to do? And um, I think that's also what's beautiful about the way the MBA process is, is uh, structured. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I can't speak for other schools. I applied to two. It makes you introspect at every level. So even if you have a fantastic GMAT score, uh, and even if you've gone through your first uh, interview, I think there's a point where you meet the first members of your cohort, you can still say, maybe this is not right for me. And, you know, take a step back. Yeah. 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 You know, coming to the point where you mentioned, right, the whole GMAT perspective. Um, uh, when we talk about GMAT and we, you know, talk about why GMAT is such an important test, uh, you know, for an MBA, we always tell them that's almost like an MBA in some sense, right? Because every aspect of it is actually training you to become a better you know, leader, a better manager, right? Uh, with work, how did you manage GMAT and what was your GMAT story? Uh, how long, how, how good, how difficult was it for you? Um, well, I think uh, the verbal was rather easy. So I, uh, I think my, the very first test practice I got and the final verbal score I got were pretty much the same. The ver I went skimmed through the verbal a lot because my job is about uh, reading maps or, uh, you know, seeing presentations the entire day, making decisions or reading content or communicating content. So the verbal was very easy, but I must say um, I did struggle a bit with the, um, with the quantitative parts of the assessment. Uh, not because, because even though I do enjoy engineering a lot, um, I've been out of school for a very long time. Mm. And um, getting, being able to solve those things um, within the given time and in an online uh, environment uh, was something very new to me. Um, so one, I I struggled with getting back into a schedule because I did I do work about fifty hours um, fifty hours a week with my day job and my nonprofit. So. Um, it was hard for me to take some time off for it. Mm -hmm. um, I struggled with that for the first two months, but then I came up with this golden rule, which I kind of followed even after, and it's helped me do my time management so well. I only do three things a day. So if it's a day that I train for my marathon, uh, I don't study for GMAT, or if it's a day I'm studying for my GMAT, I don't do training intense. If it's a working day, then I kind of don't do uh, GMAT studies or something like that. So it helped me um, really prioritize. I kind of used my own portfolio management skills there. Um, and I did get into a rhythmus. Um, but what I also allowed myself to do a lot during my GMAT was to contemplate how important my GMAT is. And I cannot tell you enough. And I know all the participants are also every evening after before you go to bed, I know you're opening your laptops and you're saying, um, has anyone with a 650 GMAT score gotten into Harvard? You <laughs> have to hit that, okay? Do not lie to yourself and do not lie to us. You have done that. And I know you end up getting a very philosophical answer on some YouTube video or by someone who actually got a 790 and got into Harvard saying, uh, oh, the GMAT is just a part of your application. Don't beat yourself about it. But here's what, and it, it used to annoy me. You know, I was like, can someone just honestly tell me that? I think there was just this one person who said they got into Oxford with a 650 on GMAT, but that person also had an Olympic silver medal for rowing that he did not uh, mention. But um, it just makes you feel like they're lying to you. But the truth is they're saying the truth. It's only a part of your application. And uh, I think at this point, I have to mention Kirtana, who was uh, my first uh, my first contact at CV. Uh, when we got in touch, I told her, hey, I, I got a 690 in GMAT and I'm not proud of it. I'm not ashamed of it either. Um, and I told her, hey, I have a 690 in my GMAT. Should I take my GMAT again? And she just she just looked at me. And she said, 
you have 10 years of work experience, right? Whether you have a 650 or a 690 or a 750, unless you have an 800 in your GMAT, your GMAT is not going to make a difference, right? So there's no way you're going to write your GMAT again in one month and get a 750 instead of a 690. And with the kind of profile you have, a 750 and a 690 would be the same. And unless you're going to get an 800 on GMAT, don't write it again. That was very good advice because I asked both my interviewers, both at Oxford and Cambridge, hey, do you want to ask me something about my GMAT? And they said, no, we don't care about your GMAT. So that's all I would have to tell you. Um, I think you need to know where you are at your journey. You need to know if you are going to go into your MBA trying to prove to them that you have the capability to process information, manage time, and your GMAT would be a reflection of that. But if you are one of those applicants who's applying with a lot of experience and actual results in your CV, um, they already know that you're bringing something to the program. It's a part of it. It still helps you get back into the whole study mode, which you will be doing for one or two years, depending on the program you go to. Don't take it easily, but also focus on other aspects of your application. Focus on what makes you different. The GMAT is still the elephant, the monkey, and the snake being assessed on how well they climb a tree. Tell mm -hmm. them what is the special skill you have to climb the tree or what's the machine that you have invented that helps climbing trees easily or what's the most beautiful tree you have climbed in your life. Mm -hmm. That is the story that differentiates you from other people. And I'm sorry, I'm telling you the same philosophical thing you will hear on your Google searches, but it is the truth and I'm saying it out of experience. Right. No, I completely understand. I, I resonate with so many people. In fact, I was speaking to someone today and, you know, he said, uh, well, I have a 670, but, you know, I really don't want to take it again. So I completely understand where they are coming from. And I think the entire focus everyone should have is give it your best shot. And I think the day you get into the test center to take the test, there should be only one thing on your mind, which is I gave my best, right? So, and then whatever it is, uh, you know, we go with that, but with the assumption that, yes, there could be one small, uh, you know, small tiny red flag in your entire application if it's a very low score but then you go with the confidence that if your profile is good enough and if you have other things on your profile that you could really highlight you know focus more on that rather than fretting too much on the gmat aspect right so uh, great advice again uh, great takeaway on that I, I should i should thank kirtana was her advice <laughs> but i'm just following the i'm just sending out the wise words i've heard <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so you, you, while you were talking about uh, this, you also spoke about your nonprofit thing, right? So how long have you been doing that? And uh, I remember that, you know, these were some stories that you wanted to tell through your essays to uh, more around what you are envisioning doing and why you want to be part of this entire process. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, uh, uh, you know, NGO experience and how long have you been doing that? And what is the cause that you're focusing on? Um, I think um, when someone is, um, when someone's at an organizational level where you make a decision today and you see the results of that decision in three or four years, and by then the world is changing, your decision is not relevant anymore, it can get rather frustrating to say, I haven't really made any change. And there are a lot of burning issues where you can, um, where you can change small things every day, you can make a difference every day. And uh, by my experience, my, my journey itself started with uh, an actual, um, a, another smaller sabbatical I had taken to and gone to Kenya, where I was working on an actual program. I was working, but because of some political troubles in Kenya at the time, um, we were, the project was canceled and we were asked to go back home. And I had gotten rather close to two of the organizations that was part of this program project. And I um, decided with my then partner to organize something here in Germany and continue supporting the troop programs. So it started off like that. Um, we've got one, uh, one program, which is a school that, uh, um, that supports um, vulnerable children um, who we, um, 
who might be HIV impacted or who've lost their family because of AIDS and HIV. And this was pre-COVID time. Um, the villain was something else back then. Uh, and, um, and there was another organization that supported um, uh, victims of teen pregnancy and uh, women who were sent away from their families, either uh, victims of FGM, teen pregnancy or HIV. Uh, we had a capacity building program to help them set up their own social enterprise. and. And a lot of their children were in the school. So I think the two programs uh, went so hand. When, when you say supporting, uh, are you like helping them with funds or what, what, what do you do when it comes to when you say supporting the program? So I think helping them with funds is a part of it. You always need some funds to run a nonprofit. Um, but you can help them with funds and then they would expect to be helped with funds for the rest of their lives or you can empower them so they can get their own funds. So we uh, we had a capacity building program. We started off rather small as a capacity building program. Um, we tied up with the Coca-Cola Foundation and um, a few other organizations, a few other local organizations. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that was my auto. Um, a few other local organizations uh, to uh, teach them how to set up a business, how to plan their finances, um, and then of course, generally safe sex practices, et cetera. Uh, and then we give them a little funding, um, a little funding push to maybe have their own hair braiding uh, business or to have their own jewelry making business. Mm. Um, and when more funds came in, we brought in another sub project, which, which was called WISE, where we taught them tailoring and we bought a few industrial tailoring machines. Mm. And, um, we got large orders for safari clothes or uniforms and uh, provided them employment. So we kind of scaled it up to an organization. How, how long did you, uh, what, what have you been doing this? So I've been doing this since uh, October 2015, October, November 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and now with uh, with the MBA coming up and, um, and that I wouldn't be able to actively support uh, any of the nonprofits that I work with at the moment, I have found partners. So this March I was in Kenya and we found partners cent uh, who are centralized, who are in Nairobi, who will take it over like um, an inner circle that can work autonomously at the moment. Awesome. And uh, awesome. during the time of COVID, we collaborated with the Anne Foundation, which is a 501c based um, organization. And um, I support them as part of their advisory board and also help them approach other um, NGOs and projects where online schooling can be provided because not mm -hmm. all, all children can simply switch to online schooling because there's COVID. So we were doing that during COVID. So this was uh, all part of, uh, you know, you were doing it in parallel along with your full-time job. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I had a 40-hour 40, 40 full-time job where I was a digital transformation coach. Yes. Awesome, awesome. So, um, you know, you and went... And I signed for my GMAT with it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and things changed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So, uh, you know, now, you know, after the whole GMAT, perspective, when did you really decide that, okay, I don't want to focus, uh, you know, after you decided that, uh, okay, GMAT is what you have, you want to apply with the 690. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were very clear about the kind of schools you wanted to apply to. Uh, you specifically focused on UK, you specifically focused on Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, one, because, you know, it aligned to the vision that you had in terms of, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, focus you wanted to have in future in terms of the kind of roles or, you know, whatever industry you would want to work on. Uh, what, what is the other kind of research that you did? Did you actually speak to Alan's? Because um, one very important part of this entire MBA journey is one to, you know, be very clear about what you want to do, which is planning out, you know, what you want to do next. Uh, making sure that that decision is uh, enough for the investment that you get to make, uh, you have to make for that particular course. Uh, the second aspect of it is also uh, more from a perspective that um, uh, the other aspects, right? That is this geography the right place you want to be or why not US or why not, you know, any other geography? Why, why were you so focused on UK? And what are the things that you did to research more from a networking perspective or alums or, uh, you know, talking to the schools. What is the groundwork that you felt you needed to do to clearly finalize that these are the two schools I wanted to get to? Um, 
so I started with the geography. Again, it was an, an elimination process. I started with the geography. Um, I, uh, my life is in Europe. I will always be in Europe. And if, if I ever had to move and work somewhere else, I'd probably be in the East. I'd like to explore Japan a little more. Uh, I would uh, I would enjoy working in the U.S. to understand their work culture. I've had a few teams uh, in the U.S. that I worked with in the past, but never really in person. But uh, I did not really want an education from the United States. So mm -hmm. and also spending two years when I have 10 years of experience was uh, a bit of an overkill. Um, that was a very lavish investment on myself. So um, I think the time was one one major reason. And that left me with the option of, uh, of France, um, Spain, Italy, and um, the UK. And uh, since I am learning Italian now, I think Bocconi was a choice. But again, I did not want to live in Milan. Um, and uh, I, I personally, since I have lived in Europe for such a long time, would not want to go to a European country without having learned the language. So um, that left me with the UK and I've always wanted to, I actually wanted to go to Oxford. Um, my first choice was Oxford. Um, Oxford remained my choice till Cambridge and Oxford accepted me. It was the hardest decision of my life to go to Cambridge instead of Oxford. Um, so I decided on these two schools. So Cambridge was just my plan B. All right. Um, you also got scholarships from uh you know, uh, Cambridge. So tell me a little bit about the scholarship process and um, also the kind of people you spoke to. I remember um, you, when you were researching on Oxford, you had spoken to, you know, the Skoll Scholar uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, we networked on, right? So uh, what was the kind of research you did for the scholarship part? Because one other thing that, uh, you know, students always all have on their mind is once they decide the schools, the other aspect of it is also to understand what are the scholarship options that are available? How do I uh, research on them? And how do I talk to the right people to understand what are the options that they can look at while applying? So how do you go through that process too? And tell us a little bit more about how you plan the scholarship aspect too. Right. So um, I'd say the scholarship was not my deciding factor. Hmm. Uh, I got a scholarship both at Cambridge and at Oxford. Hmm. Uh, the deciding factor was the process of the application. And like I said, there was no deciding factor. Even after Cambridge offered me the scholarship and Oxford had not yet given out scholarship positions, I was like, I'll still go to Oxford, right? Like this, is, this amount is uh, not something I want to give up on my dream for, but at the end, I think I had to speculate a little more um, on how the entire process was and also um, a few information. So, so there was the COP26 that happened. There was work being done through the COP26 and, and what the universities were doing. That was my final decision point. But to go back to your question, I think the first thing of course starts with getting the information that you can already get that's free, that's available on the internet. Um, there are both schools that I um, wanted to apply to. I also looked into LBS for a bit and LBS also has their own events. Uh, go to these events, talk to them. They're very helpful. Um, the um, the Forte Fellows Foundation does, uh, I think every three months they have like sort of an online event day where every, there's a breakout session for each of the schools and you can talk to people from these schools. Um, uh, that's specifically for women candidates only, right? The no, women. everyone can go to the Forte Fellows. Uh, okay. You can actually also get a Forte Fellow Foundation if you are a male candidate mm. who has done a lot for women's rights. And so it's, okay. I think it's about women in workplace. Okay. And this is my understanding of what they also have a few other uh, application tips and things like that. It's like, a, imagine like a huge exhibition with stalls, but mm. instead of a hotel, it's happening on, um, on an online platform. Um, those were excellent uh, situations for me to really understand what was available for me, what was not. Um, LinkedIn is your best friend. Uh, update your LinkedIn, please. Just update your LinkedIn. That's going to come come in very very handy. Um, I did reach out uh, to. I reached out to a lot of alumni members. Um, very few of them actually responded, but early on, I personally directly reached out to one alumni from Side Business School, and he was very helpful. Uh, happened to also be in Germany. And I was looking for people from Germany who went to the UK. Uh, so um, I think that was my first point of contact. 
Um, and then, of course, both schools uh, are more than happy to set one-on-one -on -one calls with you. And Oxford there was brilliant. Um, so I think um, she was always available within a week's time. Um, I could send her all my questions in an email and she'd get in and do a little call with me to uh, give me all the answers. Because um, there was also the confusion whether I should do an EMBA or an MBA. Mm -hmm. So both schools were very, uh, very helpful with that. So they become was this, was this before you got the admit or was this after you got the admit? This this was this was before, this was all before. This was I was just like this. Maybe I also attended a crack verbal um seminar just like uh, the other wonderful people here today. Um so this was all before. You could just say, Hey, I'm interested, this is what my profile looks like. I can't seem to decide if I want to do an EMBA or MBA. Can you tell me who would be the best point of contact? Um and then I think when the journey starts, it's also administrative problems. They don't have the time to take that care of you, um, so much care, right? So you need to really utilize the time between round one and round end of round four last year. That's when they're more, the customer service is a lot better, I would say. Um, but after that, it was, I used the GMAT club forum um, to find out more, to find out more alumni members connected with them on LinkedIn. Um, and I think after I had my GMAT, uh, I, I, I saw a recording of Crack Verbal on the GMAT forum and, and then I did get in get a mentor. And even though my mentor didn't really change anything in my application, my mentor gave me the confidence to understand that I was enough, right? And that was very important for me at that point. Um, and Harish really helped me with that. Right. So, I'd say this was the whole journey. And every time I went more and more, I had more and more self-doubt and my mentor was more like my emotional support human, right? Right. Uh, you know, coming to talking about the whole application process, uh, you know, you mentioned you worked closely with uh, Cambridge alumni, right? So was that also a reason to steer you towards Cambridge or one of the reasons at least? Actually, no. Yeah? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I mean, yes, uh, of course, uh, when I did get in, uh, and, and I did, uh, a good friend of mine was an Oxford alumni too, uh, and uh, it was really hard to tell him, I won't be going to Oxford. Um, I think, I think in a way, uh, of all the people I reached out to on LinkedIn, uh, I did not hear back from a lot of Cambridge alumni. So there was always a black box over there for me. So the fact that there was someone who went to Cambridge and who was there and who said I could help you through it was was very helpful for me, uh, but both of them were completely supportive. And Ox because Oxford sent the acceptance first, and Cambridge sends. I think they they take more time processing each person. Um, both of them were like, we know you want to go to Oxford. We'd love it if you went to Cambridge, but I'm happy you went to Oxford, and that's where you want to go. We deserve it. They were extremely neutral, and they gave me the exact same inputs and the exact same insights for I think both the applications really they, they didn't seem biased I would say interesting um, so one big takeaway I think we have uh, you know from this part of Priya's journey is uh, research very well uh, make sure you use LinkedIn as a very important tool to network reach out to people uh, it's a very important part of this whole process don't look at it more as a you know checklist but it is a necessity uh, more because I think when you have that kind of research and insight from a particular school, you're more confident uh, about not only yourself, but more about the school. And I think those tiny bits of insights that you get from these alums or from these sessions that we have, um, actually put in those words in your application, right? So that your application also doesn't look very shallow and very bookish. And uh, because you have to understand that when you're applying to top schools, it has to have that kind of an insight. It has to uh, talk about genuinely about who you are and where you come from and what you really want to do. I think uh, that's a very important point. And uh, all these uh, aspects are a very important part of your research, which is important for you to start you know, as soon as possible, because if you are looking at R1 as your deadline, you have to start, you know, today to get started with that research um, so that you are more clear that these are the kind of schools you want to apply and this is what your future looks like for you, right? So a uh, great, uh, you know, pointer on that too. Uh, how was the, um, uh, so what I understand also from, uh, you know, the way you articulate 
is that I don't think essays was too much of a problem more from a writing perspective. Uh, I'm sure you said verbal always was your strength too. So I think uh, more from that perspective also uh, things were fine. Um, you had the right mentor to you know hear you out and give you the right inputs about what to do next. What were the kind of, uh, if, if I had to ask you that uh, there were so many things that you did not know uh, when you started the entire process. Uh, if you have to give some advice to your, uh, you know, uh, self a year before, what 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 would be the kind of advice you give them more from the journey perspective as an applicant? What are the things uh, you should have been aware of uh, before you got started, which you didn't know? Um, so I started as a blank canvas, so which I'm I'm kind of happy I did because I could find I could really fill this with a lot of information. Uh, I was obsessively, um, I was obsessively spending as much time as a normal human being my age would spend on Netflix, researching MBA for months together, because I had, uh, in fact, I had, I had wanted to do the MBA a year before. Uh, I did all my research, and then I continued doing a little bit of research in my own slow pace, and then I applied a year later. But I think the one advice I would give everyone uh, here is that we're often used to applying to jobs, right? And I think, uh, I, I, I hardly think anyone here just finished their bachelor's. You've probably got a year or two of experience. So you're used to applying a job. When you apply to a job, um, you talk to them about why they need to hire you, right? So you need to keep this approach when you apply to an MBA too. So an MBA is a very different program. It's not a master's in a field of expertise. It's not a master's in sustainability or a master's in engineering or a master's in, in medicine. An MBA is a master's in administration, right? So the power is not just at the faculty, the power is also with the students. So as much as you want to, and you're tempted to write in your essays, I want to do an MBA because after my MBA, I want to do this. I need you, I need you because as much as you're tempted to do that, think and convince yourself before the journey, why do they need you, right? You want to focus on that because that's what they're focusing on to. The power of an MBA, there's a fixed part of it, which is the faculty and the school and the curriculum and the business partners that they have. The flexible, the variable part of every year's MBA is the cohort, what kind of people they get in. And they're also in a very risky situation if they don't have a very competitive cohort. So focus as much on why do they need you? What's in you that differentiates you from other people? That helps you build the confidence and I will tell you this, when the questions are out for the application, you will get the, the instant you read the question for the very first time, don't sleep over it, you will get the answer in your head. Write that down. Maybe articulate it better, but while you're in the research phase, don't just think about why you need an MBA, how you are going to convince them that this MBA is needed for you. Think about why they need you in their MBA. That's going to be a huge moral boost for you. And it's going to make getting that one, because every essay question that you see, and if you sleep over it, you'll have seven good answers for it. Then you'll have to see, oh, which one shall I say? But if you already in your mind being, you know, incubating this, that they need me because I can bring this to the cohort, right? If you keep thinking about that, then you can really get that, that one spark the instant you see the question. And that's the answer you need to work on. And this is, this is advice that I wish someone had given me. Um, uh, so my imposter syndrome doesn't kick in, but I would really say there is something in you that you will bring to that program. You're better than everyone else in one thing in this world. What is that? And you are, even if you don't think you are, you are. So just focus on that. Perfect, perfect. And I think, uh, you know, everything is about, um, sometimes, uh, you know, we are not self-aware in all ways, right? Good things as well as bad things. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, what you need to do is, you know, talk to people, talk to your family, talk to your friends, uh, try and understand, you know, if there is some part of you which you don't know yourself, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe colleagues, maybe, uh, you know, your manager whom you, who you're going to ask your recommendation from. Uh, I think talking will give you, um, you know, more ideas around your skills and your strengths. Um, there is, you know, there's 
there are questions, there are uh, situations where they even, you know, when they have those LORs that they have to write, you know, during that entire process, even putting what are my strengths and what are my weakness from my manager's point of what we should suggest them becomes a, you know, a challenge for most. So I think uh, these are the challenges uh, which are part of the process that you have to focus on and uh, uh, excellent advice, I think, uh, you know. I think one story is um, I actually did not tell my manager what to put in my LOR. I just said I need an LOR. Uh, and um, my manager wrote me a fantastic LOR. It made me want to cry. His, his letter of recommendation was so beautiful. And I actually thought he didn't like me. So after reading the LOR, he gave me, I was like, really? And then I had to talk to him. I was like, why did you write these things? And he's actually noticed me at work. And he's he's noticed things about me that I would have never, you know, assigned as character attributes of mine. So I think MBA or not, it's always good to talk to people about, you know, the strengths that they see and the potential that they see for you to improve. Right. So your, your boss was uh, a, a German? um uh austrian actually austrian. okay okay so, so yeah so i think you know that is one challenge that we as indians face more from uh, that articulation skills do not come very easily uh, you know more from a recommendation perspective and uh, that is why uh, you know for all the people who are attending the session today and going through this entire process make sure that you prep your recommender too. That is also a very important part of the entire process. Uh, it's not about uh, you know the role or uh, the level of the recommender. It is more about how how closely they have worked with you professionally, um, how well they know you professionally, and you know if you can get someone who can articulate well, uh, that will be really amazing. Uh, like Priya was uh, lucky for that, but uh, you know just just in case if you feel that could be one of the challenges that you'll face. Uh, during your recommendation phase, uh, go ahead and, you know, start to, uh, talking to your recommender now, um, you know, start having that conversation and trying to understand that, uh, you know, what is it that they should be focusing on more on the strengths part or, you know, at least telling your side of the story if you think uh, things are not the way it should be, right? So uh, it's very, this is part of the preparation that you need to do as part of your application process. I think especially uh, well, something I'd like to add to that, and I think especially something that might be a problem for uh, for candidates applying from India or any of the Commonwealth where, you know, the official language is English, is you cannot ask your manager explicitly to articulate better. Because in Europe, um, it's something they take for granted that you would correct them or want to improve their articulation because no one, no one's native, native tongue is English, especially if you're not from the UK or Ireland. And, um, and, and for instance, my uh, um, my manager did send it to one of our American colleagues or he did talk to another native speaker and work on it. And they don't consider it as an insult if you ask them to change some words or say, hey, that needs to be written differently. But if you are in a Commonwealth country where English is the official language, then it, it also is something that you need to handle very delicately. With, with your manager because you probably would be working with him or her for another couple of uh, months. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I want to tell everyone is don't take this part also lightly. Make sure that, you know, right from the beginning of the process, you've also figured out who is your recommender and, you know, what you're going to, uh, who are, maybe you need more than two or three people because if you're applying to five or six schools, um, you need at least two recommendations per school. So you need someone who is okay to give you you know, five separate recommendations from five different schools. So uh, if you can have more people, um, then that will be a, you know, great idea. So I think that could be something that you would want to focus on. Uh, tell us about the interview process uh, uh, for Judge in Cambridge. I know, and, you know, I, I know there's a very different interview process. Uh, it, it involves not only the essays, but you also have Kira Talent uh, videos. Uh, and plus the entire interview process is more, uh, very uh, behavioral kind of a questions than too much about the standard interview questions that are asked. Uh, both Oxford and Cambridge follow that uh, and have been following this over the years. So who was, and Cambridge is known for uh, alumni interviews. So how was your interview and uh, was, your, uh, was it an admission committee person who interviewed you and what did they 
want what did you think they want to focus on because you already had a lot of communication with that school you know before you were applying right or throughout the process so mm-hmm. um, how 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 did they know you number one um, and uh, you know who were who was your interviewer and how did that whole process go for you um so yes we did have um we did have a video uh, we had a video um the kira part that mm-hmm. everyone had to do for oxford um and it had to be done for a few optional uh, for for the porter fellowship and the the um, romba the lgbtqia fellowship so for these two um cambridge asked for a video interview or mm-hmm. it was just a video answer and oxford had a video interview for every candidate mm-hmm. and oxford has alumni and admissions committee doing interviews cambridge always has a faculty member so it's the other way around but um mm-hmm. and uh, at oxford i think uh, i had my interview with the head of admissions david 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 mm-hmm. fowler um david fowler david bollum and uh, i i forget his name now uh and at cambridge it was professor david reiner who i had been actually following very seriously even before i knew he was my um professor uh, or he was the professor doing my interview because again there was the whole cop26 and there's the whole discussion about carbon pricing and how do we put a price on carbon and stuff. so he's he's done some fantastic work in that area so i've already read some papers of his so when i saw his just like i've read this name somewhere um i think that was my first first point where i flickered i could go to cambridge right when i uh, when i had my interview um so um i was really really bad at both the video uh, interviews um and i think both of them uh, ended awkwardly with me on a pause with my mouth open if that happens to you you're not alone i still got into both the schools so don't worry don't beat yourself about it um i uh, i'd say it's just about seeing how you work under pressure right so again work on you work on your key what makes you tick so you can finish saying that in one line so and the strategy worked for me because it was a i think it was a 2 minute talk that i had to give and i kind of finished giving my key message or kind of the trailer in 30 seconds so i knew even if i kept talking and the video rudely cut me off that the big the big bang that i wanted to give was already there and then i teetered down into you know filling the time with stuff so that would be a good approach if you're not sure you can you can give that that fantastic finishing line in time mm-hmm. um other than that i'd say just be honest in your interview don't prepare for your interview to you know just go through why are you doing your mba why do you want to be here why you would like to go to the school um don't learn it up be be natural you don't need to have perfect english the, the, the both the mbas get people from all around the world and no one's english is perfect right so don't try to rote memorize or just have i think by now you would have written it in so many essays and spoken about it so many times with your mentors or seen so many videos or practiced in front of the mirror or in front of your dog so many times you know why you want to do these things so keep it very organic keep it very natural and um I think keep it easy. I cracked a lot of jokes with both of them. So we laughed a lot and I was I I was just being myself. I was sarcastic. I made comments about the elections. I made comments about the COP26 that was happening. Um just think of them as people like you um sitting beside you on a train ride for 30 minutes and chit chatting with you. Just don't don't take the interview seriously because you've had enough time. I mean take the interview seriously but don't freak out. because you know why you're here you know what you want and you've had enough time writing about it recording about it practicing about it so just go there and be yourself i would say all right awesome so i think confidence is the key over here uh, you know focus is more around so if 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 at all you had not known about uh, or if you would have not read about these papers that your interviewer had written would you have gone back and researched on them you know more to emphasize that once you know who's going to be your interviewer uh, how much of research is important um in fact uh, i knew so i think with oxford i didn't know at all who my interviewer would be so i was uh, we just had i think i was on one of the first days uh, my interview was on one of the first days and we had like a 
like an all hand pre interview call for the shortlisted candidates like an informal get to know call so that's when he was already leading that call and um when he walked in and i saw the name i was like ah oh, it's the guy who organized it so i didn't really have much time with oxford to know who my interviewer would be or what they would be um i didn't know that he did come from an admissions committee so i focused a little more on um on yeah what i was expecting and what what i could bring to uh, bring to the mba uh, and um the partnerships and the sort of uh, companies that i already know uh, known the kind of companies they partnered with so i pulled out some common threads that we could talk about uh, but if you don't know and if someone if it's an alumni member who is working in an industry sector that you know nothing about that's also fine just be yourself um in cambridge i think they they connected us to faculty members based on our post mba goals so since i said i wanted to do science based target i of course got a carbon pricing professor um and they also let me know that it would be him almost at 3 days before my interview so if you don't know your professor if you don't happen to be someone who reads random science papers when you're bored uh, don't worry about it you'll know who your professor is and the faculty pages are well updated and you can see the work that they're doing and you don't need to read all these papers to impress them or anything but if you have nothing to do with it then just ask them hey you've written papers on this and i haven't read about this can you tell me encapsulate me if this is something i should be focusing on in my mba that's a great way to get the conversation yeah yeah or even end the conversation right it's exactly. it's, it's a great way to end the conversation too awesome awesome yeah. so i think we've got some really really great insights priya thank you so much for uh, on every aspect of the process uh, i think uh, you know your insights and your thought process is amazing i think that uh, you know that shows uh you know how much of effort you put into this entire process more importantly and uh, more from you know for the people who are listening and um, i think it's it's an evolution right the whole process is so much of um uh, information at every point and you learn so many things right from your gmat which is you know number one thing that priya mentioned uh, don't fret to fret too much about it if you already have great things on your uh, profile just focus on that uh, you know the so second aspect is having very clear thought process around your goal um really trying to understand that don't go through any shortcuts or it's not about the essay it's more about why you really want to spend that one year or two year for that program uh and the third aspect is doing your research well networking well um as you would have known from this process b schools do uh respond or do help uh if you have questions or queries about the school even before you get in uh it's all about the kind of interest you show uh, i remember priya you were also when we were talking the other day uh, you know i think after your interview and when one after you got an admit you mentioned that uh, they almost because you've been you had attended so many information sessions too and you had been uh, corresponding with them over email uh, there was one part where they actually knew you uh because you already uh you know had been in corresponding the, for with them for so long right so i think that also shows your interest to the school see if you are really looking at applying to that school you are going all in right you are completely committed and involved in that entire whole you know process which i think is extremely important now especially if you're looking at top schools uh they do value that a lot Uh, so so more from uh, were you like an international candidate applying to uk or since you already have a uh, german citizenship right um, uh, how, how did that work was that uh, or th will that be completely different for indian applicants how how does that work um i've heard and i'm again i'm just going to call it rumors because like i said i was i have interacted with the admissions people in both the schools mm -hmm. um i've heard that the gmat is a lot more competitive for indians mm -hmm. uh than it is for europeans uh but i don't think that actually makes a very big difference either again i think what they want is what's the niche you are bringing with you so you might hear things like that that say oh yeah the minimum the minimum uh, score cut off for indians or for chinese for the chinese candidate and i've read this in so many forums that for the indians and chinese yeah you need at least a 700 that it needs to be with a 7 but if you're from europe you're still okay with a 600 i i don't think so because 
they're not going to reject you based on the GMAT score. So they're still going to, I think the five, I think 560 or no, 6, 620 is what they said. Both the schools said they would like to have. So if you have less than a 620, they might not look into your application. But um, if it's, um, if you have more than a 620, then they're still going to read your application, right? So I think the GMAT was the only thing that I thought that I read on the internet is might be different for the different um, different uh, countries. There are also some other things that I don't really understand. For instance, uh, with the German citizenship, German, English not being my language, I do not need any English proficiency for visa. Whereas Indians who study all their life in English language need to do another English proficiency for their visa. So not everything in the process makes sense, but this has nothing to do with the school. This is just governments and their strange rules. Mm. Um, but I don't think I had any any big advantage because I applied as a German or from Germany, except that they knew I had some international experience, which I think you have too. If you have worked in a multinational company from New Delhi, from Bangalore, but you actually spoke every day to someone in the US or someone in Thailand, you have the same international experience. So I don't think that changed much to my angle. Right, right. Cool. So thank you so much, uh, Priya. I think that was great. Uh, let me just open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions, you can just either put it on the chat window or Q&A. Uh, I'm already four minutes over time, so I would like to take questions if there are any quickly. I'll just wait. All right. So I think we don't have too many questions because of oh, Oh, I like your confidence. Okay. Thank you, Bhuvan. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much, uh, Priya. I think... Uh... This is amazing. And, you know, for all aspirants over here, if you're looking at applying to top schools, your dream schools, put in all your, uh, you know, heart into it, the entire process, go through it, talk to people, uh, reach out to Crack Verbal. Uh, we would definitely love to help you in each and every part of your journey, whether it's GMAT or the application process. Any, any final words of wisdom, Priya, and then we can call it a day. I think I wish you all the best of luck, uh, whether you get into your school of choice or whether you decide during your journey that your school of choice is completely different or whether you decide not to do your MBA. Um, this is some fantastic time, just enjoy it. And even without an MBA, if you go through the application process, you will come out a lot smarter than you went into it with and you'll come out with a lot more insight about yourself. So. So do it anyway, uh, irrespective of the outcome. You can always change your mind later. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, I think again, uh, you know, golden words. Thank you so much, Bria. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for giving us time on, uh, on a nice Saturday evening where otherwise you could have, you know, binge watched Netflix or, you know, had a beer with your friend. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And I think this is uh, an amazing investment towards your next step uh, for an MBA. Look, look, keep looking forward to, I mean, we'll have a lot more sessions like this. So please subscribe to us on YouTube and, you know, make sure you, uh, you know, listen to us and keep track of our emails of these amazing sessions. Thank you, Priya, once again. Um, all That's the best. For these amazing words. That's so kind of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all the best for your uh, next phase of your life. I would definitely love to reach out to you after your MBA, maybe another session, uh, you know, trying to more about how your journey has been. I, I, I would really love to hear from you again. Oh, I am so excited. I'm just packing up my last boxes and in three months, not three months, uh, in a few weeks, I will be gone to Cambridge and I am so excited. It's all I can think about right now. So. <laughs> And uh, thank you so much, Shikala, for, for organizing this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice Saturday. Bye.